Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning, depending on where you are. I'm Mark McClellan. I'm the director of the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy. And on behalf of Duke, Duke Mar Margolis, I'd like to welcome all of you to today's webinar on preparedness to combat infectious disease and drug resistant bacterial threats. Uh, we're very pleased to have you with us today. Before we begin, I want to thank Nicholas Harrison, Cameron Joyce, Marianne Hamilton Lopez uh, for organizing this webinar, webinar Luke uh, DeRocher for helping us put it together, and special thanks to the AMR Action Fund for generously providing support for the webinar today. This webinar is part of our broader policy research portfolio to address drug resistance infections and AMR by focusing on actions to restore and sustain the market for novel antibiotics and bacterial diagnostics. And as we'll talk about today, we're going to focus on infectious disease threats and drug resistant bacterial infections. There are many aspects to uh, having an effective market function in this context. Policymakers have an opportunity to take steps to improve preparedness to recognize, understand, and combat these threats. Infectious diseases and drug-resistant bacteria continue to pose a significant and growing challenge globally, and effective preparedness policies, a full spectrum of them, can help combat these threats. There have been a number of initiatives and a lot of attention brought to this topic, uh, thanks in no small part to the experts who are joining us today, and policymakers have already implemented several important so-called push initiatives, uh, that is market pre-market funding upfront to help advance research and clinical studies to develop countermeasures against viral and bacterial threats. These include things like funding to support new vaccine platforms, research accelerators such as CARBEX uh, to promote the development of novel antibiotics. But increasingly, there's been more attention paid to pull incentives post-market incentives to, to build on those pre-market steps and help uh, antibiotics that are promising get through advanced clinical testing and then sustained uh, manufacturing and uh, distribution in markets. In the United States, stakeholders, including the Duke Margolis Center, have continued to work on advancing initiatives like the proposed Pasteur Act, which would provide subscription-like payments designed to prioritize the development and appropriate use of novel critical need antimicrobials. And while the Pasteur Act is expected to have a substantial positive impact on the market for novel antibiotics, there are a range of complementary strategies that can support and sustain the market for both generic and novel antibiotics as well. Uh, for example, we've heard a lot lately about the fragility of drug supply chains, and that applies to many antibiotics as well, with uh, concerning disruptions in these supply chains that can and have led to antibiotic shortages impacting healthcare systems and patient care. Uh, there are different policy approaches being considered right now that could improve supply chain reliability and promote more uh, effective and sustainable availability of antibiotics and other drugs. Effective surveillance systems are also important to ensure public health authorities, health systems, healthcare organizations can respond rapidly and effectively and appropriately to emerging health threats. These surveillance systems not only provide data for decision-making in health emergencies, but can also contribute, provide an infrastructure that can support post-market ongoing surveillance of antibiotic resistance. Policymakers can also support public health preparedness through evidence development infrastructure that can help respond to infectious diseases and to evaluate antimicrobial therapies when they reach the market, since uh, the evidence available on many therapies is limited when it first comes to, to market. Support for new clinical trial, real-world evidence networks focused on infectious diseases could offer steps to uh, mitigate the post-market costs of uh, monitoring antibiotics and, and thereby help promote the availability of innovative uh, antibiotics. And this kind of network could also contribute to updated guidelines, more timely and informed updates to support the most appropriate use of antibiotics as they come to market and as experience accumulates. 
And then finally, clinicians and public health agencies can combat the spread of infectious diseases more effectively when health systems are equipped with rapid and reliable viral and bacterial diagnostics to inform therapeutic decisions. So all of these domains, manufacturing, threat surveillance, evidence development, diagnostics, support the success of countermeasures against viral and bacterial threats, and in particular support the development, availability, and effective use of novel antibiotics that target drug-resistant infections. So we're going to discuss these topics today with the goal of understanding these challenges better and also opportunities for making more progress towards effective solutions. I'm very pleased to be joined in this discussion by a panel of experts, and we'll hear more from them about aligning proposals to bolster preparedness to address both viral and bacterial threats, how health threats can disrupt drug manufacturing supply chains and create shortages, ways to address uh, those potential disruptions, and then a range of incentives and supports for sustaining the development and effective use of novel antibiotics in particular. So with this in mind, I'm really pleased to introduce Lynn Philpy, who's Senior Global Health Officer at the Office of Science and Technology Policy, Evan Lowe, Chief Executive Officer and Director at Paratech Pharmaceuticals, Pytel, Payal Patel, who's a Medical Director of Antimicrobial Stewardship at Intermountain Health, Thanks for joining us, Pyle. And John Rex, a longtime colleague of ours who's Chief Medical Officer at F2, F2, F2G Limited and operating partner at Advent Life Sciences and Professor of Medicine at the McGovern Medical School. To get our conversation started, I'd like to ask each of you who are joining us today, take a few minutes to highlight or preview any key ideas that you think are most important to the conversation today. And then I've got a range of follow-up questions and topics uh, that I'd like to, to bring up, as well as to facilitate some dialogue among this entire group. Uh, and uh, um, I just remind our audience that we want to hear from you all as well. You can submit uh, questions using the Q&A tab on Zoom, and we'll try to get to as many of those as possible. Uh, so, John, maybe I could start with you. Great. Thanks, Mark. And uh, thanks to you and your team for this very timely webinar. Um, Relevant to today, I am a physician trained in internal medicine and infectious diseases. I spent 15 years as a practicing doc at the university level, uh, and then about 20 years ago moved into regulated industry, where I've done a variety of things uh, across the, the whole spectrum, small companies, large companies. I was part of the advisory group for the first national action plan in the United States. Um, I am the chief medical officer of a small company that's developing a drug, uh, and I write a lot about the problem of developing drugs. You can say that my career has really been about three things. Uh, how do you build the companies and the teams that create new drugs? How do you progress them through R&D? And then how do you keep them on the market once you've invented them? And I'm going to focus my comments really on the drug side of this, where um, one of my favorite metaphors is antibiotics are the fire extinguishers of medicine, and we need to think about uh, creating them and taking care of them the same way we do the fire department. And there's, it's a great analogy because when your house catches fire, when apartment number one catches fire, apartment number three, two is threatened uh, almost immediately. And it is too late to start building the fire department. You actually have to have done that several years before. And if infections are exactly like that. Uh, they go quickly. And if you don't have the right tools, you get in trouble. And your, today's themes have to do with viruses and bacteria. And COVID's an interesting example of the world catching fire for lack of a fire extinguisher but we were actually quite lucky in that we were close to being able to create a good fire extinguisher with the years of effort that had gone into developing rna-based vaccines and they work it's magic okay um i don't know that we can expect to see that actually i don't think we can expect to see that every time and we definitely can't expect to see it for new bacterial threats and so it, the, the, this leads into, into my sort of my core comment, building on your uh, list uh, of things that need to be done, which is that we must actually build and sustain over the long term the ecosystems that create new drugs. And uh, we need a long term vision for doing that. We have put in place push activities but pull activities to actually drive them forward, to drive them forward selectively. 
uh, are really critical and you don't really know which one's going to be the best one until it gets to gets to done. And one of the best ways to force that to occur is to and do, do the kinds of incentives we've been talking about for the Pasteur Act, where we will reimburse, we will buy new, new interesting antibiotics, not all of them, because they won't all be interesting, but interesting ones will get purchased for us as U.S. citizens uh, through the Pasteur Act, which we hope to get passed this year. And that actually will fix all the other things along the way. It will call, it will make it appropriate for people to work in this area. They will, it will it will drive the companies to appear. And the facilities that are needed will be sustained because there are people actively working in this area, uh, and that then will make the drugs available. Which is really why I went into pharma 20 years ago. I was an ID doc who was frustrated because they didn't have the drugs I wanted. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. And uh, the, that's that's my key theme today: antibiotics, fire extinguishers, and you got to invest in them for the future. Thanks, and we'll come back to those uh, investment issues and, and policy opportunities. Um, let me turn to Lynn next. Lynn? Thank you, Mark. I'm very pleased to join you today, and I'm really looking forward to hearing the diverse perspectives from my fellow panelists as well. Um, I hope everyone tuning in today has heard of CARB. If not, I'll give a brief cliff note. The Combating Antibiotic-Resistant Bacteria CARB Task Force is the coordinated federal One Health response to antibiotic and antifungal resistance. The first national action plan was released in 2014, and we are currently in our second five-year action plan, which takes us through 2025. These efforts focus on infection prevention and control, stewardship, surveillance, diagnostics, treatment, and international efforts. And these efforts have shown us several things. Number one, government intervention works. One example from these efforts, preventing infections in the first place is a fundamental step towards combating AMR. Every infection prevented is one less instance of an antibiotic or an antifungal being used, preventing the opportunity from resistance, from resistance to occur in the first place. Infection prevention and control and stewardship efforts in the first five-year CARB plan resulted in a decrease in the number of deaths in the United States by 18% and in hospitals by 28%. Number two, AMR is a multi-sectoral uh, issue and the US government cannot do it alone. We have to partner with foundations and academics, think tanks, the private sector to move the needle on AMR. For example, as you've already heard mentioned today, um, the CARB National Action Plan called for the establishment of an accelerator for antibiotics and then partnered with Wellcome Trust in Boston University to establish CARBEX. This is a public and private partnership, um, and there's been a total of over $503 million into the CARBEX program since 2016. Those funders have not only included the U.S. welcome, and, um, but they've also included the U.K. and German government. And recently, Canada announced that they would join CARBEX. So um, we know government efforts work, and we know that government can't do it alone. We have to do this with our partners out there. And then something kind of uh, uncomfortable happens. We have all these successes. We constantly show success in our efforts, but this is a complex and multi-pronged issue. And so for every success, we identify new efforts that are needed. That doesn't mean that those previous efforts were wasted. In fact, it means the opposite. Our efforts are paying off, but there is still more for us to do. So continuing with the pipeline example, we addressed early development, but there is a breadth of effort needed to get the therapeutic to the patient. So we looked at the pipeline and we identified other areas for attention and intervention. We've improved Medicare's reimbursement to increase new technology add-on payments for novel antibiotics. And the FDA has the GAIN Act, which allows them to provide a QIDP designation. And, and this provides an expedited review process and an additional five years of market exclusivity. So we've taken these steps, and yet the companies that achieve FDA approval for a new antibiotic are still going bankrupt. So continuing to look at this problem, this administration recognizes that the current market does not fully capture the value of reduced morbidity, mortality, and disease duration. It does not account for the foundational impact of how antimicrobials are currently used in medicine and their impact on health outcomes. The market does not capture the benefit of antibiotics and antifungals treating primary inf infections, much less the benefit in treating the secondary infections of cancer patients, surgical patients, or treating chronic conditions such as cystic fibrosis. We acknowledge that we need a pull incentive that takes this into account, and we're working towards fulfilling the commitment that we made in the G7 to do just that. 
The President's FY24 budget proposes to create a novel payment mechanism to stimulate future innovation in antimicrobial products while enhancing stewardship and access. Under this proposal, sponsors would enter into contracts with HHS for up to 10 years, which would provide guaranteed payments minus the revenue under federal insurance programs, and we would focus on uh, products that address critical need infections that support um, patient access and that and also work to ensure reliable supply chains. The program will um, prioritize antibiotic and antifungal stewardship plans to ensure appropriate use of newly developed products. So this is a very quick uh, glimpse of where the USG currently is on this issue, and I look forward to digging in a bit deeper with all of you. Thank you. Great. There, thanks very much, um, Lynn. I'll go to Evan next. Great. Uh, thanks, Mark. And uh, I want to thank you as well as Duke Margolis for your leadership and continued thoughtfulness in terms of keeping this topic front and center for everyone. This is uh, hugely important for, I think, everyone. And uh, we really need to pay attention to, to this. Well, um, what I'll do here is provide a little bit of an industry perspective um, that's also informed by, for me, nearly two decades of bedside care as a physician caring for heart transplant patients where antibiotics were my next best friend. Uh, for all of my patients, but also more than two decades of doing drug development work where I've actually brought two novel antibiotics to the marketplace, but from two very different venues, uh, one in a big pharma setting, but now today in a small biotech setting, which is where about 95% of the innovation lies. And I think that's one of the take-home points I want to put out there today. It's a simple message, which is bugs always win. And our job is to stay ahead of the innovation curve. And I think our technology and research uh, enterprise here in the US can do that. Unfortunately, I think because of the failure of the current marketplace, uh, we are woefully behind in terms of the innovation uh, curve. And I think that it's one of those things where you think about historically the turn of the 20th century, the two major interventions that changed the, and increased the life expectancy of US citizens were the intervention of number one, clean water, and second, the introduction of novel antibiotics. And we are actually on, on the verge of actually losing access to novel antibiotics. And what we have today is we have a set of pharmacy formularies that are filled with older generation, older generic antibiotics that are actually fraught with peril as relates to both diminished efficacy as well as impaired safety. And I think it's one of those places where I think that you know, we really need to uh, devote those efforts we have through those push incentives that you've already mentioned, Mark, which I think are fantastic. Uh, the challenge is, and I've said this to John Rex before, who's been intimately involved with Carbex, you can take these technologies, put them into a phase two parking lot, and guess what? There is no exit ramp uh, because there is no path forward for the cost of uh, late phase three development work, nor uh, has there really been a successful product uh, in the marketplace long-term in the last 10 years from an antibiotic perspective. Uh, what I'd like to offer here for the panel to think about and for us to talk about are our two fixes. Uh, first, I want to thank the U.S. government and uh, Lynn for the, the, the comments that, that you were able to, to share with us. Uh, I think that the U.S. government needs to do more. And I think there's a whole of, whole of government uh, approach here that I think goes beyond the efforts that you've already highlighted that we're very, very appreciative for. Uh, beyond that, though, I think we have to fix the marketplace. And I think there's a very simple fix to the marketplace that Despite my personal efforts uh, at being on Capitol Hill for the last five to six years, but not been able to actually get traction for, which is to look at the bundled DRG system uh, that currently we uh, put together to actually uh, care for patients today uh, in the uh, hospital setting. Uh, because of that, and because of the margins in hospitals being as, as small as they are and clearly exacerbated during the COVID pandemic, uh, formulary leaders, the pharmacists have prioritized costs over being able to recognize and pay for the value that novel antibiotics provide as uh, life-saving uh, therapies. And I think it's uh, unfortunate that the marketplace currently is broken, fragile, and failing. And I think it's an adjunctive intervention that must go forward in addition to a pull incentive. Because a pull incentive is not going to fix the underlying marketplace dynamics where right now the incentive is actually to put cheap, generic antibiotics that don't work and that actually hurt patients because of their adverse event profile. And I think that's something that we really must look at. And I think HHS has the authority, but I think what I've learned is that we do need the legislators to actually come to the plate and help us there uh, as well. 
And I think if the marketplace continues to uh, behave in, the, in, its, in its current form, just like with J&J, &J, big companies are just continuing to pull out from this research and development area, and we need them to stay in. I think the other critical issue that you've already mentioned, Mark, that is really, really important that we have to take seriously is our nation's over-reliance on other countries to make and supply antibiotics for us. Our country's own strategic national stockpile mostly contains older generic antibiotics. In fact, one of them was actually approved by the FDA in 1967. That was before we landed on the moon. And I don't know of any of us today that are using 1967 technology and do we believe as treating physicians that that's actually okay for our mother, father, brother, sister, grandmother, grandfather to save their lives. So I think we need to, we need to really recognize that and recognize the need to step up with regards to clinical efficacy and improved safety with regards to providing these, these products in, the, in our national strategic stockpile. And I think the other, other piece that we learned from COVID is that we can't provide these novel antibiotics on a dime. We're not a Pfizer. My, my Paratech company is uh, actually about 250 employees compared to maybe 50,000 for Pfizer that could actually step up and provide the level of stockpile resources that are required during a pandemic. And there's no one here that can actually promise to me that the next pandemic is not going to be bacterial in origin. And I think that that's a, that's a place that we need to think about relative to our overdependence on API and other drug supply products from India and China. Just to give you a few statistics before I close, 95% of generic antibiotics API, that's active pharmaceutical ingredient, is supplied and sourced from China. That's precarious and actually represents a national security threat for us. According to FDA, 88% of manufacturing sites that make APIs for all U.S. drugs were overseas as of 219, and India imports 70% of its bulk drugs from China. And given the current geopolitical instability that we see uh, in Europe today and around the world, that only exacerbates, I think, the risk that I see going forward, that we must think about ways to onshore manufacturing and not just for API. API is not the solution. We need a holistic solution that takes us from API all the way through final, final drug product. I think in terms of a little bit of good news, uh, I think when you think about these public-private partnerships, I think BARDA has been an outstanding leader with regards to thinking about public-private partnerships. We have one of these at Paratech where we're developing a novel fourth generation tetracycline uh, for a bioterrorism pathogen called anthrax. With it though, BARDA has given us enough uh, resources to actually move our, or actually add a additional supply chain that is fully US based from API all the way through drug product for our, both our oral and our IV product. Our little company Paratech will be the only company on the planet, I'll say that again, the only company on the planet that will have a fully integrated API through final drug product supply chain for a novel, innovative, FDA-approved antibiotic. And I think that that is, we're very proud of that, but is that, a, is that good enough for all Americans? Absolutely not. I do think we need to step this up, and I think we have the opportunity to do that. So my advice is to get serious about onshoring now because the process of onshoring takes time. We're five years in to this particular relationship to just get to this point. AMR continues to be an escalating material threat. And I think for us to recognize this and continue to put attention on it and to continue to think together to work with our policymakers as well as our partners on the Hill to think about a whole of US government solution um, would be something that I would like to continue to uh, be right there with everyone here on this panel. So thank you for the time. Uh, thanks very much, Evan. Um, Payal? Yeah, you know, I think um, I come at this from a, a different perspective as a practicing ID physician, and I kind of want to highlight a success that I've seen and then maybe, you know, um, highlight some more policy measures that I think could really help. And so one success that we've seen in the United States is just over the last 10 to 15 years, we've seen antimicrobial stewardship programs go from being in place in about 50% of hospitals to now almost 100% of acute care hospitals in the United States. And there's a number of reasons that that's happened, but I would say one of the main reasons is because of policy. So it was mandated by the Joint Commission and you know, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. And so there can be a really great effect from effective policy. Um, and I think that, you know, that really, we saw what happened with that during the pandemic. In the first three months, um, when we weren't sure what was happening with 
bacterial infections in patients who had COVID, there were a lot of doctors who were giving antibiotics to patients who had COVID. We weren't sure. And as research came out that showed that not a lot of those folks had a bacterial pneumonia along with their COVID pneumonia, antimicrobial stewardship programs were really able to help get that antibiotic use down in the United States. And you saw that happen in a quicker trend, really, I think due to antimicrobial stewardship programs being in place in almost all acute care hospitals compared to hospitals kind of worldwide. So I think, you know, we've seen a lot of success, but one thing that I wanna highlight is even before the pandemic, we were already having burnout issues and workforce issues throughout, you know, infectious disease, whether that's in infection prevention and nursing, and also infectious disease physicians. And then we had the pandemic and there's you know, been a lot of people who've been burnt out from working overtime, double time. And so now we're trying to build back that workforce. And I think one example that was so important and something that I've seen you know, before the pandemic was in the nursing home setting. So we often will do educational interventions about infection prevention, whether it's hospital acquired mm -hmm. infections or antibiotic stewardship. And what happens is we'll give a talk and within a few months, everyone that we've given a talk to in that nursing home setting has left for a new job. So that workforce turnover can be so demanding. And, and then when we had COVID in those settings, these were people who may have only been on the job for a few months. And again, you know, saw what was happening and, and you know, may have wanted to get out of there. And so I think that's definitely something that we in the field have been thinking about from the PACCAR perspective, which is the Presidential Advisory Council on Combating Antibiotic Resistance. We had a big report come out on pandemic preparedness, and we really wanted to focus on workforce expansion because we feel like this was already an issue before the pandemic and it has become much more of an issue. And it's something that we can work on now, no matter what the next you know, infection, infectious disease pandemic is going to be. So those, those are my thoughts from kind of the frontline perspective. Uh, thanks, Pyle, for helping to kick us off. And I do want to come back to some of those workforce and other related preparedness issues. Um, as we open this up to discussion, I see we've got a few um, questions, comments in already. I'm going to try to work those into the discussion. So all of you who are joining us today, any other points you'd like to raise or questions you'd like to ask, please uh, put them in the Q&A. Um, but to kick us off, just talk a little bit about, a little bit more about the different kinds of threats out there, viral and bacterial. And Payal, maybe I could stay with you on uh, how the response to an infectious disease outbreak goes and uh, how those responses may be different when the outbreak is viral versus bacterial. I know you've been doing a lot of work, as you just mentioned, on pandemic preparedness, but uh, I know this is part of your, your day job more broadly as well. Yeah, you know, I think that's a, it's a great question because they're so intertwined. So if, if you're in the midst of a bacterial pandemic, actually it's gonna be very similar to a viral pandemic because what happens is with viral pandemics, there's often also a bacterial component. You know, that was what was happening early with COVID is people were looking at numbers from the 1900s with the flu and remembering that when people had the flu back then, many of those people had a bacterial infection as well. So all of what, what we've heard today is really that antibiotics are so important, really, no matter what. And I should say antimicrobials because fungal infections are also a part of whether it's a bacterial or viral pandemic. So there's a couple of things that can really happen. And I'll tell you, you know, kind of what I noticed. And that is that, you know, PPE, so that personal protective equipment, diagnostics, all of those things are going to be important, no matter what kind of infectious disease threat that you're facing. And it's all about, you know, that supply chain. So thinking about what happens from a patient coming in to the end of their visit. So one thing that like strikes me that I think back to is when we started, we just didn't have enough of one component of the COVID test in our hospital. And so we had to kind of pass back and forth this pager. We called it the COVID testing pager. And everyone who called needed a COVID test, but we just didn't have enough tests. And so we were trying to triage, okay, does this person need a third test? You know, they keep presenting with symptoms of COVID, but the other tests were negative. 
Or does this person who's going to go to surgery need a COVID test? And the problem was all of those people needed a test, but because of that supply chain, we were having to make really tough decisions. So I think um, as we think about preparing for the next infectious disease threat, it's less about what it will be. It's more about using those horizontal interventions that will prepare us kind of no matter what. So that, that makes a lot of sense. And maybe I could go to Lynn next. Uh, so the Biden administration, Lynn, as you know, has done a, a lot of work thinking about, um, based on that COVID experience in particular, how to respond to an emerging viral threat, including uh, addressing supply chain issues like pathologists raised, as well as getting all the way to a uh, vaccine that's been demonstrated to be safe and effective and be widely available within 100 days. So this is a pretty ambitious goal on top of uh, sort of a fragile system, as we've been hearing about. Um, can you talk a little bit about why you think the plan can work and what further actions are needed to um, be able to achieve those kinds of ambitious goals, uh, given the, the, the challenges that Payal just described. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks. It is an ambitious goal. Um, getting to the point where we can treat someone in 100 days is an ambitious goal. But it's one that we have to set to really push us to be able to respond to a new emerging threat in an emergency situation. But one thing I'd like to talk about with AMR is that it's not necessarily an emerging or an emergency situation. This is something that we have to deal with every single day already. It's not going to happen in a month or six months or a year. It's happening right now. And so therefore, I think of it a little bit more as a slow burn. Um, and we need, we do need that whole of government approach to, and, and we have that with the CARB task force to be able to look at this problem and think about all the things we need to do now. That being said, there are things that work for preparedness for both bacterial and viral. Um, IPC has already been mentioned, you know, simple things like washing your hands, wash systems, et cetera. And the 100 day goal is also just one of the efforts by the Biden administration. We also have the national biodefense strategy which addresses viral and bacterial um, pathogens. And this calls for building um, risk awareness at the strategic level uh, through coordinated research efforts um, and, and can categorize naturally occurring, uh, accidental and deliberate biological risks. And it works at the operational level through one health surveillance and detection activities um, and allowing us to detect and identify biological threats and anticipate biological incidents. Um, we also have the 2023 to 2026 National Health Security Strategy and its accompanying implementation plan, which calls for federal action to reduce AMR threats. And the, NHS, the NHSS highlights the importance of collaborating with industry to develop medical countermeasures. Um, so, you know, we have these things in place that work for both viral and bacterial, but we also can't lose our efforts to address AMR um, just in being prepared for the next threat. Because again, this is something that we deal with every single day. It's here already and our efforts need to address the, the today's threat as well as what's coming down the, down the road. Let's uh, so thanks for the answer. And I, I would like to turn to the ongoing uh, threats and issues we're facing. I mentioned in my opening comments, and some of you all alluded to as well, issues around um, fragile support for development, manufacturing. Um, we've heard a lot lately about fragility of supply chain. So I want to go to Evan and John, bring you all into this conversation too. On an ongoing basis, uh, it seems like we've uh, got both uh, fragility and limited development of new antibiotics, especially for these emerging threats, as Lynn was just describing. You all have talked about some steps to address that, and I'd like to go into them further since we've got a few uh, questions and comments from the audience, too, about that. But first, for, for either of you, Evan or John, um, we're going to talk about pull incentives, but are there some other reasons why antibiotic supply chains may be fragile and and uh, uh, why it's been hard to establish? Um, Evan, I know you talked about onshoring and the example that you had from uh, your own company of going all the way 
through with a more reliable supply chain? Uh, or do those all come back to mainly financial uh, reasons? Are there some other things we can do to to strengthen supply chains as well? Well, you know, let me let me jump in on the supply chain since it's since it's um, you know relevant to my my core business. <clears throat> it does boil down to cost, Mark. Um, when you look at the supply chain costs of why we actually created our fully integrated supply chain for FDA approval for our novel antibiotic, uh, Nuzira, in Europe is because we couldn't afford what it would take in the US. Um, and there's no biotech company today doing antibiotic research that would actually invest the, in the US because they can't afford it. And the other piece to that is that the requirements by FDA for the lot sizes for validation batches for FDA approval continue to actually be at a scale that anticipates large quantities of usage on launch. And I think that's another opportunity here for us to think about, which is that, you know, with the utilization of antibiotics being much more self-directed through antibiotic stewardship programs, as Payel has talked about, which I think are fantastic, antibiotics really, I think, should be looked at almost in a rare disease context where they've got much more focused uh, manufacturing requirements, and that could actually be more affordable as you think about maybe even onshoring it. But to give you some idea of that, you know, we wouldn't have come to the U.S. to build a secondary supply chain in the U.S. unless we had that part of funding. And that actually illustrates another national secu security risk, which is that when you have a single supply chain for any product, and you could have a flood, a fire, a bomb, or what have you, guess what? that supply basically goes to zero overnight. And so having duplicative supply chains is very, very vital to uh, to maintain its health. And I think that, you know, I think, unfortunately, I think right now, all we have is a focus on API suppliers in the US. That's not good enough. We need to bring it on, on shore to go all the way out through drug, drug product, as well as to develop a distribution network that actually is facile and can provide antibiotics in a just-in-time fashion. So you, you covered a couple of things there, both the, what, what I think Lynn called the slow burn of, of resistant organisms where, as you said, you may not need a very large supply right now, especially if you've got a good surveillance and uh, good stewardship programs in place. So you can target use effectively, intervene early. You also talked about when... Um, there's a breakthrough from from those conditions and a um, uh, maybe more rapid uh, uh, growth in need and when uh, a limited supply chain can be exhausted. But it seems like we're having trouble even getting the limited supply chains in place. And John, that brings us back to your famous uh, um, yeah. uh, fire extinguisher, fire department analogy. There really is an important public good here around um, antimicrobial resistance management that's about targeted uh, detection early and targeted uh, treatment yeah. so that you don't need to use a high volume of services. And, and that's why I think um, you and others here have been such supporters of Pasteur. Um, we have had a question from the audience about pull versus push incentives. So maybe you could push a little bit more on pull <laughs> incentives for us and uh, talk about why that is, uh, I think you view it, and you said in your opening remarks, uh, yeah, a critical right. element of getting to reliable supply chains, not necessarily huge supply chains, but reliable supply chains and uh, uh, use when you need it of these um, uh, treatments for emerging resistant organisms. Yeah, the, the concept of push and pull starts with just thinking a little bit about why you buy anything. Um, you know, when the, when a new iPhone comes out, you can choose to buy it or not. But the reason that the, the, that the vendor is pushing it out there is there's something special that you and they can advertise it to you and they can encourage its use. Strangely, with new antibiotics, because we work really hard to make difficult infections rare and we try to get rid of them quickly. The, the reaction to a brand new antibiotic is, well, that's wonderful. Well done, you. That's uh, such an important thing that we're not going to use it. And in our current system, the only way that I, as a manufacturer, generate any income is if somebody actually puts it into a human being to treat an infection. And so this is the shift, the mental shift that has to occur, and is that which is the thing about a fire extinguisher or life insurance is another good example. I have life insurance. 
didn't pay off today. I'm delighted about that. I'll keep paying my premium. I've got a fire extinguisher under my sink. Lunch did not catch fire. Good. But had it been there, I'm glad to have that fire extinguisher. And so the, the notion, the application here for push and pull, push is very simple to understand. It's providing money to small companies, most often academic research groups, to do the early work to attempt to discover a new molecule. And it is important that we have a wide variety of people trying to do that. Just finding new drugs is incredibly hard. Uh, it's easy to kill bacteria. It's hard to be selective about killing only the bacteria and not you in the process. Um, and then the amount of money required to get from finding all of those things to an actual developed product is in the hundreds of millions of dollars, ultimately. I mean, when you count all the things that fail along the way, you've probably spent nearly a billion dollars. But if I were to hand you a brand new antibiotic today, and say, here it is. Here's here's the, the Evans built a plant. It's all on shore. It's ready to go. I hear the people who know how to run the plant. You actually would have a net negative uh, net worth that in the uh, several hundred million dollars negative because that drug is not going to get purchased. You've actually got to make it every year. Talking about IV drugs in particular, they, it's real, quite expensive to make a sterile product. So you, if you want to have that drug available, but not use it in the same way as you, you don't use the fire extinguisher, but it's helpful to realize that you do use a fire extinguisher every day. It's there in your kitchen. And the only part you don't use is the part that gets you wet. Everything else about it you use. Same thing with antibiotics. You've got to think of them as something you use. Haya Patel is using them in her hospital, even when she's not putting them into a human being because they're available for that one person who might need it. And by treating that one person, the next person doesn't get it and the person after that doesn't get it. So that's the power of having the right antibiotic. And that's where pull comes into place. The concept of pull, pull is something that we've been discussing now for 15, uh, close to 20 years. And we have not developed any better solutions than this. Governments need to think about buying new antibiotics like fire extinguishers. It has to be done at a government level. It's not going to be done at a lower level than that. And we need to buy selective products that are really high value and pay for them the same way we do a, a road or the fire department. Same concept. Make it available and then don't use it unless you really need it, unless there's really a fire. So that's the concept of poll. Pasteur is the U.S. government or so it's the it's the legislation that's been introduced into the U.S. Senate and, and the House that we've now been refined over the over three Congresses in a row, I believe, and close to getting it pull, pulled through. We need to get passed through in place. It it gives it, it uh, tells the U.S. government to take six billion dollars over about a decade and use it to selectively buy really high value new antibiotics. That's the concept of Pasteur that we're pushing along right now. Great, thanks. And uh, a couple of other questions related to this. Um, um, Evan, I'll go to you from Kevin Otterson. So we just had a great tutorial on Pasteur. You also talked about, Evan, earlier the need for further DRG reforms, building on what Lynn, as mentioned, has already been implemented, these add-on payments for the, the use of uh, costly um, uh, AMR agents when they're uh, needed. Um, can you talk a little bit about why you think other steps beyond Pasteur are needed to uh, address this uh, uh, pull uh, challenge? Yeah, thanks, Mark. I, you know, look, I, I like the concept of Pasteur. I think it has a place in terms of helping, you know, stabilize the marketplace, but I think it doesn't actually fix the underlying marketplace dynamics. So I think a complementary piece is something that I've I've talked about quite a bit, which is thinking about from a DRG perspective, is there a way to create a separate payment scheme just for antibiotics uh, so that uh, there's a way to recognize value to actually have, have a payment scheme that makes sense. We've looked and investigated NTAP. We appreciate the uh, the step up with regards to reimbursement, uh, but in 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 functional reality, uh, it's it is a complex system that most hospitals actually don't know actually how to how to uh, put in place and uh, actually uh, um, uh, implement. If you think about it today, if you look at about the 6,000 hospitals out there today in the US um, that are treating patients today, only about 600 of them from our data, and we're in the marketplace, this is our fifth year with an IV product. There's only about 600 hospitals that actually use branded antibiotics. The rest of those hospitals have formularies that are 100% generic. 
And when you think about that, those are the hospitals that I would not want my mother, father, brother, sister, grandmother, grandfather to go to because they will not have the best of care. And when you think about where we could potentially, you know, leverage that, you know, the new technology, you, you first start in those hospitals that actually understand the value of these type of innovative antibiotics. But the challenge again comes, you know, how are we ultimately going to get the hospital paid for so they don't feel as if it's a lost leader. Uh, but I always argue that it's the best in terms of patient care, better outcomes, less 30-day readmission rates. And, you know, we're in the process of generating a lot of that health utilization data market. I know that you're very passionate about that help us understand what the what the relative payment schemes could actually do for us going forward. Yeah, so let me, uh, We we this has been a great discussion. We've got a limited amount of time left. It, it seems like what you're envisioning or describing or um, something that may not be fixable just with uh, DRG payments alone, but as Lynn also mentioned, there are other steps taking place too. Conditions of participation that involve uh, implementing um, uh, uh, good uh, uh, stewardship programs and additional, as you said, um, uh, surveillance programs to track antimicrobial resistance when it might, you know, to help people be on guard for when they might need to use uh, special antibiotics like the one you've described, diagnostics, et cetera. So uh, maybe we talk about what might go into like this vision for the way that care should be delivered. Um, we're making progress in areas like surveillance and diagnostic testing and appropriate use, uh, and then maybe come back if we have time to other payment steps or conditions of participation, regulatory steps that could go uh, along with that. So maybe Payal, back to you. Um, how are we doing on getting good evidence systems in place um, to know when um, uh, to, how to use antibiotics appropriately? And I guess that depends on having good diagnostic uh, uh, capabilities in place to know what the causal organism is um, and its resistance properties to know when you might need to use some of these special antibiotics like Evan was just describing. Yeah, like I think, you know, again, we've seen a lot of success in inpatient um, acute care hospitals. I say that because, you know, we still have, there's still kind of the wild, wild west out there in nursing homes and outpatient antibiotic use. And what, what would be surprising to many people is that most antibiotics that we use are used in the outpatient setting. So that's, you know, when you go to your primary care doctor and you say you have a UTI or sinusitis or you go to the ER. And right now, most inpatient antibiotic stewardship programs don't actually work in that outpatient space. So that's I think something that we in the field of antibiotic stewardship are focusing on. And that is something that I think, you know, policy could really help. Again, trying to mandate those programs in the outpatient setting. W what we're doing here at Intermountain Health is we're trying to focus on kind of some low hanging fruit in the outpatient space. So we're working on reducing days of antibiotics. We know now, we didn't know many years ago, but we know now that five days is just as good as seven days or 14 days for things like pneumonia, sinusitis, UTI. So that's kind of one of the first ways that we're doing things like this. But I think that, you know, again, we think about our elder, you know, colleagues or family members in nursing homes that often the first thought is to give someone an antibiotic if they're, you know, feeling out of sorts. But what's happened is in those nursing home spaces, because we've used so many antibiotics, now the infections that people get are often antibiotic resistant. So we're, we're working in a space where we've kind of already gotten to a lot of resistance in those settings and trying to move backwards. Totally agree that diagnostics and all of those things that we're using in the inpatient space are going to be important in those other settings as well. And I just want to mention one more thing. When we talk about surveillance, I've learned a lot myself being on PACCARB about our veterinary colleagues and how much they are really working on surveillance in the veterinary space to understand, you know, infection surveillance and all of those things. And at the end of the day, it's all kind of linked. So using what we've learned both in the animal and human space to kind of strengthen our surveillance systems on both sides. Yeah, certainly part of the One Health approach, and maybe that brings me back to um, to, to Lynn. Um, Lynn, you started out with kind of an overview of a range of policy initiatives that can help with 
kind of all of these aspects of getting us from where we are to where we need to be. Better um, uh, appropriate antibiotics available that, that work against resistant organisms, coupled with prevention uh, programs, uh, appropriate prescribing, as, uh, uh, as Payal was just describing, surveillance systems, uh, appropriate diagnosis, and, and then uh, hospital and outpatient nursing home systems that can get the right antibiotic to the right patient. What else would you like to add about, it seems like while we've made progress, we've still got a ways to go. Um, so we talked about Pasteur as potentially helping. We've talked about how that might not be enough to get practice change in, in all of these different real world settings. Um, so what can help uh, help us get there based on um, the, the, the programs and reforms that you've been involved in developing and implementing? So now you've said one health and opened the door for me to talk about what else we're doing, which I really appreciate. Um, I think it's critically important that we take those one health steps that protect these new drugs. We're putting a lot of investment into the push and the pull here. Well, hopefully into the pull here, but we're certainly putting a lot of investment into the push, the clinical trial network. Um, looking at this problem, we don't want all that to be wasted when we finally succeed in getting these new drugs to the patients who need them. And there are risky behaviors that we still need to address. And some of that is how we use these drugs outside of the human medical study. One of the things we're doing um, during my time at OSTP uh, is we're looking how we use these drugs in agriculture, um, specifically how these drugs are used on produce. And um, they are used to, especially the antifungals, they are used to treat um, pathogens in the, the safe food that we eat, you know, on fungal infections on strawberries, citrus greening on oranges. We need safe food. We need healthy food. We don't have, sometimes we don't have alternatives to treating those with anything other than these desperately needed medically important antibacterial and antifungal drugs. Unfortunately, um, we're a bit behind and recognizing that we can take steps on the agricultural regulatory side to protect our human health outcomes as well. And we're doing that by working with EPA to set new um, regulatory guidelines on the use of uh, human and animal um, medically important antimicrobials as pesticide and wood preservatives. So there will be a concept note being released within the next few months about what this looks like, asking for public comment on the process, um, it is, as, as those who worked with the U.S. government through the Veterinary Feed Initiative recognize and, and through Guidance 152 recognize, it's a very long process, so there's a lot of work to be done. But really excited to see the U.S. government and the interagency taking these really innovative steps to make sure that we're doing everything we can to protect these antimicrobials once we have them. Thanks, uh, thanks, Lynn. And uh, John, maybe we could turn back to you. We've talked a lot about Pasteur. We've also talked about steps that Pasteur by itself in terms of sporting antibiotic development may not address in the delivery system. So Lynn covered um, One Health and, and steps to prevent resistance emerging in the first place. Could you talk a little bit more about uh, some of the issues that Evan brought up uh, and that uh, Payal brought up, your perspective on what else along with Pasteur would help get the, uh, the, the right detection, the right use of uh, uh, antibiotics when we need them, but but prevention and, and uh, stewardship as well. You know, we've not talked a lot about diagnostics and pathways for using them. And it, it's helpful to realize that, you know, the image you might have of the, uh, of a doctor waving a, a box over somebody, the, the, the doctor in Star Trek waves their scanner over the patient and says, oh, that's Arcturian fever. You know, and you get a very specific diagnosis. The, the difficult thing with many of these infections is that the bacteria that cause them are also bacteria that, that you live with every day. Uh, you know, urinary tract infections, uh, bacteria that lives in your gut that you need, uh, pneumonia often ca caused by an organism that lives in your nose quite happily. A third of the people watching this webinar right now have the pneumococcus in their nose. And that's the most common cause of bacterial pneumonia. But most of the time when you got pneumonia, it's not bacterial. But if I test your nose, you're going to have pneumococcus in it. And that's actually what makes the diagnostic strategy so hard. So I, I think that, and that's what makes, so to come back to practice change, why as a doc do I look at somebody and I say, well, well, well I don't really know what it is, but 
I'll sleep better if I give them an antibiotic. And the, the willingness to trust the pathways to say, well, actually, it's okay. You know, and, and I think, you know, Pio, you see you nodding your head up and down about that. I, you know, how hard was it to get people to look at somebody on a ventilator, oxygen concentration is going down, obviously has infiltrate on their chest has a pneumonia and you're saying, and I'm not going to give that person an antibiotic mm. tough and it takes a lot of training, a lot of experience and takes good guidelines and good data to cause people to change practice. And so it needs to feel natural. You need, it's like a lot of things, you need to make it inevitable. You need to make it feel right that it's okay to make that choice. And that is a lot about educating the healthcare community. It's about educating patients as well. I mean, it, you know, antibiotics are rightly viewed as magical tools and the desire to have one that can be very, very strong. So there's not, a, it's not an easy fix. It's a huge people thing. A lot of this is about social behavior patterns and how you educate all of us to think and live differently with a little bit of risk management. So I, I think it's, it's you've, you've got to build all that other, all those other things in there, but you know, got to get, you got to create the new drugs, Pasteur. We need to get Pasteur passed. I got to say it one more time. Um, and then lots of other things that become possible if you have the tools that you can decide to not use, but at least you've got the choice. And in, including that, data collection to develop yeah. to update the guidelines to give the practitioners confidence that they don't right. have to uh, treat that infiltrate with a, uh, uh, with a, a needed uh, antibiotic for future infections where it really is going to make a difference. We just have a couple of minutes left. Um, it was a great uh, summary statement, John, from you about the important things that need to happen. Maybe we could turn quickly to our other participants. Any final thoughts, Payal? Yeah, you know, I think I just want to highlight again that we we have seen, you know, sometimes it's really easy to get stuck in the, um, you know, this is what we need, this is what we need, but we want to go back and see what has worked. And, you know, we know that getting people into um, programs and hospitals where we can help make some of the decisions that Dr. Rex was talking about is really important. So we need to do that, continue to do that in the nursing home space, the outpatient space here in the United States. And then really bring that out internationally into many, many different programs, because we still have a huge lack of antimicrobial stewardship programs throughout the world. Um, so I think that's what I want to highlight. Thanks. Um, Evan, quick final thought. Yeah, look, I think that uh, all of these ideas are great and we just need to keep pushing forward uh, on it. I, I do think, you know, as I think about a place where we could devote potentially some more innovative thinking is an area that you know, you oversaw for many years, Mark, in uh, in your role as administrator at HHS, which is that we have a pretty good system on the OPPS side in terms of understanding when new interventions come into the outpatient setting in terms of determining value relative to cost. I don't think the inpatient side on the IPPS side is quite as sophisticated. And I do think that there's probably learnings that we can cross fertilize between the OPPS side and the IPPS side to really create an understanding of value. And with that, I think comes, I think, a more sophisticated dialogue that we could have about actually how do we actually recognize value and pay for value as it relates to these life-saving antibiotics to help the marketplace, I think, uh, evolve and uh, I think uh, be one that actually will be much more dynamic and uh, supporting innovation. All right. Thank you. And Lynn, you also already did a great summary of a wide range of uh, policies that are intended to address the spectrum of issues. We still have work to do, but I appreciate uh, from all of you the, the great perspectives and, uh, and interest in making uh, further progress, including on Pasteur and including on developing uh, a healthcare system, an animal health system, behavioral uh, uh, changes that can really support uh, effective control of uh, infection. Uh, so work to do, but some some reasons for, for optimism about the future. Um, I want to thank all of you for joining us today on this session to explore policy directions to bolster preparedness and, and take a range of steps to combat drug-resistant infections and mitigate the impact of antimicrobial resistance. I'd like to encourage you to look for our upcoming report on bolstering public health preparedness by investing in post-market incentives for novel antibiotics, which covers some of those Pasteur-related issues that we talked about. It's intended to be a resource for both policymakers and policy researchers on 
uh, incentives to advance the bioindustrial base, improve the efficiency of medical countermeasure development, and bolster the public and private sector capacity to detect and respond to viral and bacterial threats. The other big thing that came out repeatedly today, having a robust system for not only developing and making available, but using uh, antibiotics effectively and taking other steps uh, to address resistance. For now, I'd like to thank you again for joining us, and we look forward to keeping in touch about these important issues on antimicrobial resistance. Thank you so much.